remembering the fact that this union was established with the support and encouragement of Countess Markovic, we decided to dedicate this room to her memory. And well, uh, after 1916 and the execution of the Labour leaders, uh, Countess Markovic was on the run. Uh, she was either in jail, she was in jail six times, she was, she was either in jail or on the run for what was called sedition against the British government. And the Sinn Féin, the newly formed Sinn Féin political party, decided to put up candidates in the British government elections. And 78 Sinn Féin members were elected uh, to that uh, parliament. And instead of taking up their seats in Britain, they formed an Irish government in 1919, and she was appointed Minister for Labour. So she straight away set out to talk to the leaders of the British-based unions here to encourage them to form an Irish-based union. And so she did that with the craft group of uh, a number of unions, and she was successful in bringing them together and supporting them economically with finance from the Minister of Finance, who was then Michael Collins in the newly formed 1919-1921 government the first Dáil Airden, who which operated in opposition, if you like, to the existence of the British government here. And the money from, for all of that came from John Devoy in America. So uh, she encouraged the people to set up the union. It finally got off the ground on the 10th of May, 1920. And the Countess gave them £100 to organise the first meeting in the Abbey Theatre where over a thousand craft workers came together to discuss the formation of the new union. But this is the record of the hundred pounds in the bank book, which is treasured by this union as part of our archive here. And uh, it's, it's the bank account for the union starting off on the 10th of May, 1920. And remarkably, um, I have the minute book of 1920, the first meeting, the second meeting, and then at the third meeting, um, we had people reporting that it was very difficult to organise workers after darkness because the black and tans were out and that he was fired upon at Rialto Bridge uh, by the black and tans by being out during the curfew. And people were prepared to sacrifice their lives back in 1920 to organise this union. So this union has great beginnings. It's a very strong union because of our historical links and we hold those um, principles dearly today. And so it can't be forgotten that without her, this union probably really wouldn't exist. She uh, got heavily involved with James Connolly and uh, in the formation of the Transport Union and in the uh, 1913 lockout organised by James Larkin. And it was during the lockout that she, she had a motor car, which most people didn't have at the time. And they helped to go up and cut turf up in Wicklow and she delivered the turf all around the tenement houses so the people could stay warm during the winter months of the eight month lockout. And uh, she worked tirelessly all around the clock, either delivering uh, turf or having else, somebody else do it in her car while she attended to the soup kitchens at the time in Liberty Hall. So it was through that social connection that she got deeply involved in both the labour movement and the political movement. And of course, she was a great suffragette, great interest in women's affairs. And through all of those connections, she got, to, she got grounded in socialism, where she dedicated her life to helping the Irish people, both politically and industrially. 14 North Frederick Street was the Department of Labour operated by the Countess. Now, it was undercover. Uh, it had a sign on it that the house was for, to let, and the, the rents asked for, asked, being asked for were ex extraordinarily expensive or high rents that nobody was interested in, and therefore they got away with uh, operating the building uh, under cover from the British um, detectives that were going around trying to investigate where the Countess was and what she was involved in. There's also uh, a number of stories about how she secured uh, the documents in the building. There was allegedly a music uh, school in the, in, the, in the building where they, they concealed some of the documents in the uh, pianos. And she always had a large trunk on the top of her car and there was any word of a raid, the trunk was filled up with her documents and she drove off to some other location to preserve the documents. 
So uh, 14 North Frederick Street clearly was the Department of Labour between 1919 and 1921 when the Countess was Minister for Labour in that government and she operated from that building and there is no doubt about that. But she was very concerned that an Irish, a new Irish nation starting, starting out wouldn't be bedeviled by industrial disputes. So she asked for the support of the workers and the employers to engage in what was called industrial tribunals and that people would be bound by the outcome of these tribunals. And there are some remarkable records of women that she appointed to these tribunals who uh, assist in the resolution of disputes. And uh, so there was, she was never really involved in industrial uh, disruption, only in conflict resolution, which is another string to her bow as far as we would be concerned, because um, she was the, the one that, I suppose, led the way into the 1946 Trade Union Act here in Ireland, where collective bargaining rights were bestowed on the trade unions here for the first time. And uh, we have been working from that 1946 Act. That's the principal act of industrial relations today in Ireland. All of those robust pieces of machinery wouldn't have been in place if it wasn't for the influence, the bedrock influence, of the Countess in her early days in the Parliament. And they carried on her good work rather than dismantled it. She developed that. I don't know, I have no record, or there's no knowledge of where she got her ideas from, other than I think it was probably just her own inspiration she was committed to, if we're going to have an independent country, we have to have, after seeing what she had lived through in 1913, she never wanted to see that again. And so she wanted a, a fairer society. I think she's seen as a revolutionary. I think she's seen as somebody that promoted uh, justice and fairness in society when the employers didn't want it. Uh, she, was anti, she became anti-establishment. She was a heroine of leading people to fight against the establishment to secure what their just deserts, that they would get proper wages and conditions, a proper political system, a system that treated people fairly. And sometimes when you hold somebody up to high esteem that has achieved all of that, there's probably a concern within the establishment that that could be taken further. We would hold the view that there isn't a balance there still isn't a balance. The views of the 1916 revolutionaries and the, the uh, proclamation that hangs proudly on our wall here, uh, the ideals are ideals that we've all subscribed to and worked towards, but they're not yet achieved. There isn't equality uh, between men and women today. Uh, so she was certainly a woman of her time, but certainly the first Minister of Labour throughout Europe. And uh, the next... Um, woman politician didn't come for many years after that in Germany. The Irish government has failed to recognise that fact. Uh, everybody else had failed to recognise that fact. So in discussions with the landlord, uh, recently he agreed to the plaque being uh, placed on the building. And it was an absolute pleasure for this union, the TWU, and our national executive to honour the Countess in that way. And at least into the future, people will be able to see that fine plaque that's on that building and recognise and remember who Countess Markovich was. And if they don't know who she was, I'm sure they will inquire when they see that plaque. Keep her memory alive.